I'm Bill Bryson, and I'm very honored and astounded and even a little embarrassed to tell you that I am one of the Royal Society of Chemistry's 175 Faces of Chemistry for 2016. I was not good at sciences at school at all. Partly it was an absence of real aptitude. I was never going to be a scientist. It's just not in my nature. I don't have that kind of particular focus. Um, but more than that, even, it was, I, I think science was taught in really quite a dull way in, in, in those days. This was in the States in the 1950s and 60s. And it was, it was directed very much at people who were natural scientists, and all the rest of us were kind of left to one side to get on as, as well as we could. So I paid no attention. But I grew up with this conviction that there had to be some level at which I could engage with science because, you know, I found as an adult that I was watching programs on television like Horizon, reading articles on science in newspapers and magazines. And like anybody, I'm interested in knowing who we are and how we got here and where we're going, all those things that science tells us. So I just had this idea once I became a, a published author and was doing this for a living that it's something I wanted to do, and as soon as I got a chance to do it, I thought, I'm going to try and do a book in which I will understand science, but in my terms, it, it, you know, without equations, without formulas, without all of the sort of technical stuff, but just understand all the stuff that I've been missing out on all my life. It, yeah, but don't, don't make that decision now. I mean, I think one of the shortcomings personally, of, of the British system is that it does tend to force people to make decisions very early. Um, and, and in some ways that's really good because then you, particularly if, you, if you're making the right decision, you, then you're focused and you can go off in a direction that, that fills your fascination. But at the same time, I do think people are sometimes making decisions at a fairly early stage of life that become irreversible. And I think that's a shame. I think you know, I say that I could never have been a scientist, but maybe I could have. I don't, you know, I don't know. And uh, if I had, if if I'd had a different kind of education, if I'd had one of those magical teachers that, you know, that really, really lights up something inside you, maybe I could have become some uh, a scientist. I think there's no question that the world needs the very, you know, the very best minds should be working in science. This is. Uh, the, the, the solutions that to all the problems we face are going to be emerge from all the different sciences. So we want to get the best possible talent pool generated there. So I would hate for people to just announce, you know, sort of blindly because they haven't had the education uh, or the inspiration that perhaps they're looking for, for them to announce at an early age that they're never going to be a scientist. That that would be a shame. Teaching science well is a really tricky thing because it's got to be done, there's two, two strands to it. On the one hand, every society has a responsibility, I think, to produce new generations of chemists and physicists and biologists and so on. And you have to teach them science in a very focused and, and solemn way. But at the same time, there's lots and lots of people like me that, that are not going to be scientists, but really ought to leave school with some appreciation for what science does, what it does for us and what it does for the world. And somehow I think we're still probably missing out on a lot of those people, which is, which is why I think it is so heroic that the Royal Society of Chemistry is trying to address that. And interestingly, what I have found is that, is that in trying to engage outsiders like me, also often you are, are sort of surprising and engaging in new ways with people who are scientists themselves. That there's lots and lots to do with science, that you know, just because you know a lot about chemistry doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to know a lot about about physics or some other more arcane fields. And I think by knowing, appreciating, appreciating the whole of it, it, it's something that really, really engages people much more thoroughly and, and, and much more comprehensively. Well, for me, the, the one advantage I had in doing short history nearly everything was, was ignorance. I mean, I, I realized early on this was the only advantage I had over all the other people who've been writing science books for all these years, because I was pretty much a blank slate. And so everything I was learning was exciting to me. And, and the great thing about science, I think, especially applies to science, is that every time you learn one little thing, it leads to more questions about other things. And, and you know, science proliferates outwards in all kinds of directions. But it all has 
this relevance to you know our existence, the human condition, to where we are and how we where we exist in space and how we got here, and and that is just naturally innately fascinating. And I hadn't quite thought that through beforehand, um, but this is you know this is why scientists are doing all of this very particular stuff is is because it, it, it builds up little bits of further information to a much larger fascinating picture. It never stops, it just keeps going and going and going. But in a way that, that uh, sometimes feels slightly overwhelming if you're trying to keep, keep it contained into a book, but it, it's, it, it never stops being interesting. It, it's, you know, it's like Russian dolls or something, every time you take out a new doll, it's like, oh wow, this is amazing, what's inside this one? Oh, even more amazing, and it just keeps going on and on and on. We've spoken about the fact that science is infinite; that it just it just keeps branching out, and 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 so the more people that you that it touches everybody. So the more people that you engage, that you involve with, with both understanding and explaining it, you know. I mean, you you mentioned Heston Blumenthal. I mean, he's going to bring all kinds of things to science that a conventional laboratory chemist isn't going to bring. Or, 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 you know, that everybody's going to have different areas of specialization. They're going to be able to contribute in different ways. And you need that. I mean, if it's both, both to, to, you know, make it of interest to the, the widest possible community, but also because it's just so vast and sprawling, you need people, you know, taking charge of different parts of it. Oh, I think I think it's really, really important, really, really important that everybody who's professionally involved with science at every possible level, whether they're teachers or, you know, chemists in an industrial setting or whatever they do, but they have they sh they should realize that they are ambassadors for something, something really, really, really important. Uh, one of the questions I asked every single person I interviewed for the book was, well, you know, what? Why did you become a scientist? What was it that? Just you know, think back. What was the moment you thought I'm going to spend the rest of my life? doing science generally, but then also why did you choose this very specific thing? Why did you decide you're going to spend the rest of your life looking at lichens or, you know, molecules of some kind or, or whatever? What, what, what drove you? And, and almost every time they had to stop and think, and they would remember this magical moment that, that, was, that was changed their lives. But they hadn't thought about it very often for, for years and years. I think everybody who, who works professionally in science especially teachers, but everybody should stop and just think from time to time, what is it that's magical about what I do? Not, for, not lose sight of that. And then, you know, just convey it to people generally, whether it's your children or guys in the pub or whatever. But I think that would make a huge difference if enough people were doing it collectively. Well, that's why I say it's a little embarrassing because, because you know, I think there's no question Mary Curie deserves to be on the list, um, and and Leslie Yellowly deserves to be on the list. Uh, you know, in the sense of being a, a productive, useful chemist. I mean, I, I just I, I come nowhere near. I mean, I don't, there, there are any middle school chemistry teacher is far more deserving than I am. So I'm very very honoured, but as I say, slightly embarrassed about it. Um, at the same time, I mean, putting myself to one side, I think it's a really good thing that the, the Royal Society of Chemistry is trying to select people from lots of different walks of life. And I mean, I understand what, what the RSC is doing here. And, and, and in that sense, I'm very proud to be considered part of it. But in terms of actually deserving to be considered a face of chemistry, well, you know, I think it's very flattering, but it's, it's not an accurate portrayal. Mm -hmm.